the Spirit of God is here and, and moving and, and people come to faith in this church. And yet still I don't think of myself as particularly gifted as an evangelist. I don't necessarily think of that as, as my, my, my main thing. I remember when I was younger... I got the opportunity to preach at a large teens outreach event. Uh, it was 11, 12, 13, 14, that, that kind of age group. And what they did for this event, it was an all night awesome thing where you'd show up at church and, and in, around 10 o'clock there was a gospel time, a time where you hear the gospel, but but the night was full of busting to the go-karts, busting to the pool. I just busting, I think, roller skating, I think. I don't know if that's even cool. Maybe it was ice skating because that's way more cool. And anyway, so busting to all these things all night, just going event, event, event. Uh, but all these teens would come and and we, we do that kind of stuff. Well, um, what normally happened is, is you, during the speaking time, during the, the teaching time, heaps of kids would come to Christ. Well, I got my opportunity to do this one time. And um, so I wrote... I wrote down this gospel presentation, and and it was amazing. Actually, I still think of it as probably the best gospel message I've ever, ever done. I mean, I had these, like, uh, illustrations and these, these um, I don't know, stuff to make the point. It was, it was amazing. It was amazing. God, I, yeah, I know. Brian, you did a great job with that. I, I did. I did. I really did. And then, and then I, I got time, and I was I preached this message. Just did a – I just crushed it. I just – brought it all. I mean, it was so good. I, I know that I'm the only, none of you were there, so I can say it was as amazing as I want to. I, it, it was, I did a really great job with this. And yet, not one person gave their life to Jesus. So, so in recap, in recap, big event, heaps of kids always come to Christ, best gospel message ever, crickets, right? Anybody want to give your life to Jesus? Nobody. <laughs> well, that's embarrassing. So that was that was that was my uh, that was my my moment. I, I don't think of myself as as an embarrassing. That particular crash and burn moment was sponsored by pride and an I can do this without Jesus or praying kind of attitude. But but still, I, but still, I don't think of myself. I don't think of evangelism as my strong suit. My guess is that maybe some of you in this room don't think of evangelism as your strong suit either. And um, you, you, you feel like, hey, I, I, no, that's not necessarily my thing, and that's, that's not necessarily where, where I excel. Some of you have tried to tell people about Jesus before. It hasn't gone well. And you, it, as a result, you've kind of lost some, lost some confidence and, and maybe, maybe lost, some, um, lo- yeah, lost some confidence. Anxiety has gone up. And you don't really feel uh, bold and, and just excited about telling people about Jesus and, and your faith and all that sort of stuff. And, and you've kind of maybe found yourself in this downward spiral. I'm just, I'm just sharing this because I, I know this very well. This downward spiral where you start overthinking the simplicity of inviting someone to take that next step with Jesus. Overthinking the simplicity of inviting someone to take their next step with Jesus. Now, I say it that way as opposed to um, having someone, you see someone crossing that line from, I am not saved, I believe Jesus exists, I believe Jesus exists to, I give my life to Jesus. I dedicate my life to Jesus. I believe everybody in Jesus' generation believed He exists. He was standing right in front of them. They believed He exists, but this crossing the line to now, Jesus, I am yours. I give my life to you. I'm, a, I'm a, I, be, you know, save me and, and all that sort of stuff. Now, w- maybe you haven't seen a lot of people cross that, that line, but when I talk about our work of evangelism, it's to move people closer to Jesus. Sometimes they'll cross that, that particular line in that moment, but it's, it's simply inviting people to, to move closer towards, towards Jesus. Today I want to talk about our simple role in this. I want to talk about helping people move towards Jesus. It's not that hard. And, and I want to look at the Bible. And I have a few stories tonight well, of just moving people closer to Jesus. The, the first story is in Acts chapter 8. And it's a story of Philip. Philip's not one of the apostles. He, he's not one of the disciples. He's a guy, he's a deacon. He gets appointed later to t- help take care of the, the widows and orphans because they weren't being taken care of well. And so there, there's this Philip guy in Acts chapter 8. 
And this is, this is what we read about, about his experience here. It says in Acts chapter 8, verse 26, An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. That is the desert road. So he got up and went. So he got up and went. Now that was an angel of the Lord telling him to do that. Uh, very often with us, it's, a, it's the spirit of the living God, maybe nudging us or whatever. But the question is, do we have a willing heart? Do we have? A, he, he hears this and he gets up and, and, and goes. Uh, number well, the first thing we we have to start with is a simple willingness. Do we have a simple willingness to talk to people about Jesus? And a willing heart is a prayerfully prepared heart. Jesus, I am willing. Today, to tell people about you. I'm willing to talk about you. I'm willing to tell people that I'm a Christian. I'm willing to, to just talk about whatever. I, if you want me to talk about some, you today, nudge me. Give me the opportunity. I am willing. I am willing. I am willing. That, that is, that's where it begins, cultivating a willing heart by simple prayers. Lord, lead me. Lead me as, I, as I'm going throughout this day. For example, I was... Uh, a few days ago, uh, ah, it's more than a few days ago now, I was going down to my favorite temp, uh, table, favorite table in all of Glasgow. Okay, this is my favorite place to go study. Where is it? No way I'm telling you. And, and I was going down there to study, and I just prayed a, a prayer when I was on the train heading to city center, so that narrows it down a little bit. It's in city center somewhere. And I trained down to city center, and I was like, Lord, I am willing. I just ask, you know, if you want me to say something, I, I will say something. Just give me the opportunity. Give me that, give me that moment. And, and so I, I get down there and I get, the pla- get to the place where I'm going to get my vanilla latte. Oh, that's narrowing it down a little bit more. It's, it's only one of those places that sells vanilla lattes. And so I, I was like, you know, walking up there. I'm in the queue and I'm like, Lord, I'm willing, I'm willing. Just, I'm waiting. Just, I, I'm, I'm eager. I'm whatever. And I get up there and I order. There's no opportunity. There's no moment there. And then she's making my vanilla latte and there's no moment there. And then I receive it and thank you, but it's not really there. And, and I go over to my, my table and like, maybe they'll come along and clean up. And, and I, Lord, I'm willing. But in that moment, there was, there was no opportunity. There was no opportunity. And, uh, and so no big deal. No big deal. It, 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 willingness. See, the thing is, that I, I'm not just trying to tell people about Jesus. I'm also listening to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and where is He at work? Where is the Spirit of God at work, and what does He set up? What are those moments? I'm willing, but Lord, where are you at work, is the question. Where are you at work? This summer, I want to have a chat with one of my relatives. I've been praying about that. Lord, give me an opportunity. Start setting the, the stage for that. You know, it's been a long time, but it's are setting the stage for that. The question is, are we praying, are we praying with a, a willing heart for opportunities? Is that part of our, of our, of our mindset? Well, that's, that's where we begin. Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing today. So he's willing, and he got up, and he went, this Philip guy. And so we continue in verse 27. So he got up and he went. There was an Ethiopian man. Now, he didn't know what was going on, so all that's... All that we're about to read, he didn't know when he left what he was getting into. That's probably grace. If God would have told him what was going on, he might not have gone up and left. There was an Ethiopian man, an, a eunuch, and a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah uh, allowed the spirit told Philip, "Go and join that chariot." <laughs> uh, number two, simple courage, simple willingness, simple courage. Philip, go and tell that high official of that foreign country uh, about Jesus. What? Okay, so uh, the, kind of the equivalent thing, I, I don't know too many foreign uh, officials who are ahead of the treasuries of other countries. Remember, this is not your own country. So, so I don't know who's in charge of Germany's treasury, but let's say you're down in city center and, and Angela Merkel's there and you're, and you're like, hey, okay. And the Spirit says, go sit at her table. You're thinking, oh, Ike's, 
that that's probably too much, Jesus. I don't know how that's going to happen. There's there's going to be bodyguards there. I'll probably get shot, or, or I don't know, or at least tased. I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen there. I can think of a lot of reasons why this is not a good idea. Um, yeah, but that's the kind of obedience step that Philip's being asked to make here. We're talking the high, high official. It's probably a reason he's not warned in advance what he's getting to. You're talking about the, the, the head of the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. We're going we're to talk to this person about Jesus. Now, we usually don't have that kind of large obedience step challenge like what Philip's going through here. But my, my guess is it still feels challenging. And you're sitting there and you're talking to someone and they've had it rough. They've had a rough day. They've had a rough week. They've had a rough life. They're depressed. They're stressed. They're anxious. Let's say they're stressed. And, and you're listening to them and, and, and they're talking about their stress. <clears throat> and, and you're like thinking in the inside, man, I should pray for this person. I could pray for this person because of their stress. Oh man, should I, what, if they, what if they think that's weird? Should I ask it? Should I say it out loud? Should I, should I actually say something? I believe in Jesus. I'd love to pray for you over your stress and your stressful situation. Do you, does this even go to your mind or is it already too stressful to even think about? You're like, it stresses me to even think about praying for someone with stress. Because what would they think about? I'm just so insecure. I just can't do that. No, I, I don't know. Sometimes it's just such a big thought that we don't even go there. We're like, they don't believe in Jesus. So I'm not even going to ask to pray for them. We've kind of lost, lost before that's begun. But, but you know, I, I understand. I understand. It just takes some simple courage. Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you about, about your stress? I know you don't believe in God, but I do. I do. Uh, I'm just wondering if we're overthinking some of these moments. Are we overthinking some of these moments? And I just say, calm down. Relax. Relax, Christians. You, you serve the living God. The real, the real God who's really present, is really alive. And, and uh, just look at how simple our job is. Our job is. So, so go and join that chariot. And this is what it says in verse 30 here with our Philip story. It says, when Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? Six simple words. Six simple words to give that person the opportunity to know more about Jesus. Do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading? Could it be that... that, that it's the most simple of invitations, those most simple of moments, those most simple of questions that all it can take to start a conversation where someone moves closer to Jesus. Now, in this story with the Ethiopian eunuch, I, I'm going to give I'm going to give away the story. Uh, he, he is going to come to believe in Jesus. He's going to give his life to Jesus. He's going to be baptized that day. He's going to be baptized in that moment. He's going to give his life to Jesus and be saved. Now, even if that doesn't happen, could the, could the beginning of a gospel conversation, a message about Jesus, begin with, really, do you understand with your reading something that simple? Can it be that simple? I guess yes and, and no. I mean, no, if, if the Holy Spirit's not at work, then it's not going to get you anywhere. But the thing is, Jesus is still seeking to save the lost. God is still at work. The Father is still at work drawing people to Him. God still has a great desire and a passion that none should perish, but that all should be saved. He has a hunger. And so we should be expecting that this God with that kind of passion is moving in people's hearts and lives. And we, we just need to be attentive to it. And with simple, simple comments, simple moments, we can see where God is at work and when He's at work. And, and so I think number three, number one is willing, simple willingness. Number two is simple courage. Number three is simple openings. Do you understand? Do you understand what you're reading? I spent some time with uh, Peter Anderson. Peter Anderson is the uh, pastor of Destiny Church in Edinburgh this week. Uh, what a great guy. I mean, he's way older than me. He's like 39. It's just, it's just so, so old that guy but anyway so spent this, this time together i i man i just was really uh, impressed with this guy this, this 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 pastor um on the way home from from this uh this retreat that we were at 
Uh, I decided, well, okay, I'm going to listen to one of these. I, don't, I just know him as a person, like him as a person. Well, I wonder what his teaching is like. So I downloaded one of his messages I was listening to uh, in the car on, on the way home. Again, good stuff. It was this. It, it was a 10-part series. I just happened to see one of his recent series. It was that 10-part series on the book of Jonah. And I'm like, no way. Ten messages on four chapters in Jonah. And they're not even that long of, of a book. I'm like, whoa, I'm going to listen to one of these. And I clicked on the, the button, and it's like 50 minutes of preaching. I'm like, what is going on here? This is just, this is exciting. This is exciting. We've got a Bible preacher here. Well, during this message, it's a good message, by the way, he tells a story about um, he, he was coming back from Belfast. I know you're thinking, yay, Belfast. Some of you are like, hey. Uh, and, and he was in the airport lounge uh, for Ryanair. I know that's very generous to call that an airport lounge. He was in an airport lounge for Ryanair, and he was coming back, evening flight. He'd been preaching over there at some church, and sitting there, and the guy next to him just asked, hey, uh, well, do you know what time the, the, the bus uh, finishes? Tonight for, you know, heading back to, to Glasgow because the, the plane was running late. Ryanair, I know, shocker. But the plane was running late. And uh, another on-time Ryanair. Well, do they have a little jingle or something? Yeah. So uh, the plane was running late and was like, wasn't sure if he was going to catch the bus. So, uh, so it turned out, no, it wasn't going to catch the bus. And so Peter says these six words or six word, or words like this, five or six words. Right? Um, Can I give you... A lift. When we get back to Glasgow, can I give you a lift? Would you? Would you? That would be amazing. And and you know they kind of get on the plane, and they're they're driving back uh, after the plane lands, and they're driving back into Glasgow, and and just talking. So what are you? What were you doing? In, well, I was preaching at this thing. And, oh, you're a pastor? Yeah. What is it? What, what do you believe about Jesus? God? Well, okay, well, I believe. This. And he just kind of goes in this conversation. But those six words, do you want me? Can I give you a lift? <laughs> Whatever. Can I give you a lift? Six simple words that just began this, this gospel presentation. It doesn't have to be six words, but we're on a kick and we're going to try and make it that way. Anyway, so... Um, Six words led to that, that conversation. There's another story here in the Gospels, uh, a, a great story, a really sweet story of, with Jesus and this woman uh, in John chapter 4. And John, uh, sorry, Jesus is there at a well, and he's by himself. The disciples have gone away, and, and, and he has this special moment. It says this in verse 7. It says, a, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her. For his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. It all starts off of these words. Give me a drink. Now you're thinking that's only four words and it sounds a little rude. Well, the NIV saves the day and says, will you give me a drink? So I'm going to go with the NIV. Will you give me a drink? Six words. Oh man, I'm, I'm really overthinking this. But anyways, th those words, those phrases that starts a conversation with this woman where he's able to start um, telling her that he ultimately he's the Messiah and to give away the entire story, she comes to faith in Jesus. The whole town comes to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Just a few words can open the door to move people towards faith in Jesus if the Holy Spirit is at work. If the Spirit is in it. it it's like we nudge on the door. It's like we nudge on the door and to see if the Spirit opens it and we just need to... We need to nudge and just see where God's at work. That's what Philip does. That's what Jesus is doing here. Just kind of nudging on the door with a few simple words. And you think, oh, wow, God is in this moment. The Spirit is in this moment. Are you being intentional in your life? Are you being intentional to try and see if gospel doors will open? Are you being intentional about that? Uh, last last year, just actually less than a year ago now, less than a year ago now, I, I moved into a new flat. There's there's six kind of residences in this in this area where we're at. So five others besides me, and I've I kind of know now where everyone in in these 
and these other five other flats and the person across the street where they're at with church and, and Jesus and all, and all of that. Mary, uh, one of our neighbors, she and her husband go to St. Silas. I was standing outside the other day, maybe a month ago or so, and just listening to her tell her story, this up and down story, this special story about her and, and, and how she came to faith in Jesus and, 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 and how she's been involved in St. Silas and just how special that church has been to her. I love hearing people's stories about how they've come to faith in Jesus or, or what they're thinking about Jesus. Now, I, as a side note, I believe that I live where I live for a reason. And I believe that my neighbors live where they live for a reason. And that it just may be that God has me in this building, on this street, for these people to either be encouraged in their faith or to, to move closer to Jesus. I believe that. So as I walk in and out of the building, as I interact with the people in, in this area, I, I think that God might be in this, in this moment. We'll see if anything happens or, or whatever happens. Well, well, anyways, one of my neighbors, another one of my neighbors, has had a really rough, a really rough go of it. And I, I, I was uh, spending time just kind of listening uh, to her story. Her husband was there in, in a wheelchair, and I'm just listening to their situation. And I, and I just said, you know, would you like me to pray for your husband? You know, six simple words. Would you like me to pray for your husband? Six words. Would you like me to pray for your husband? And now, in that case, you know, she said no. She said no, no. She said no, and, and that's that's fine. I'm not embarrassed about asking if I can pray for someone. I'm not embarrassed about that at all. I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Can I pray for your husband? No, no. Would you like me to pray for your husband? No, nope. no. Nope, that's fine. However, a month later or so, she asked me. So, so, what church are you the pastor of again? Uh, regarding Hope Next Generation Church. Yeah, yeah, I know. I went on your website and I listened to one of your messages. And I was thinking, wow, I was turned down for prayer. But that one simple question, would you like me to pray for your husband, resulted in her thinking about something. And think, you know, somebody asks you, what church do you go to? Or, you know, can I pray for you? No, what church do you go to? I go to Real Hearted Hope. You never know. They go into the church. How many people have ever said, I've seen the video on your website or something like that about your church? So that one simple question got her to the, and if she listens to this message, I know she heard the message about Jesus because every week there's at least something about Jesus in, in each, in each message. It's just one simple question moving, at least getting more of the message of Jesus in, into, into her life. You ever ask you ever ask someone the question, uh, "Wanna go to church with me?" Now I say "wanna," so make it say "wanna go to church with me." Wanna go to church with me? Oh, that's so clever, Brian. I know, keeping it six words. Do you want to go to church with me? That's more than six. You want to go to church with me? And and even if they say no, God can be in that moment as they're thinking about church, like church and, and God, and, and what, what's that about? Why would anybody like you? Want to go to church? You seem so normal and cool and awesome. Why would you go to? Why would you go to church? Why would we go to church? And just getting them thinking about Jesus. Maybe you're like me though, and you're just prone to overthinking this. Overthinking this. Can it really be this simple? When you're working with a God who is actively at work trying to reveal Himself to people, a Jesus who is seeking to save lost people, a Father who is still drawing people. It can really be this simple. Are you looking for those open, um, those openings? One more thought. One more thought. Remember that story uh, where Matthew, Matthew also called Levi, where he gives his life to Jesus. Uh, where, oh, no, ah, where he, that's maybe too generous, where he starts following Jesus, where Jesus says, follow me. Let me just read it real quick. Cause I, want to, I want you to see what happens when Levi or Matthew same person when they when they uh, come to follow Jesus it says this in Mark chapter 2 uh, it says then Jesus went out again beside the sea the whole crowd was coming to him and he taught them and then moving on he saw Levi the son of Alphaeus sitting at the tax office he said to him follow me so he got up and followed him 
That's when he became uh, Jesus' disciple at that moment. While he was reclining at the table in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also guests with Jesus and his disciples because there were many of, who, who were following him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he told them, those who are well don't need a doctor, but the sick uh, do need one. I didn't call to, I come to call the righteous, but, but to, to sinners. Uh, sorry, but sinners. But sinners. So Levi starts following Jesus. And what's his evangelism strategy? He just starts following Jesus. It's not like he knows very much right at the moment. So what does he who doesn't know all that mu- much know, uh, know? Well, not much, but, but his strategy is he getting his people, his, his, his fellow tax people, tax collectors, his fellow sinners, I mean, tax collectors were called sinners back then. They're not, they're not called that today. Just for the record, they're not called that. But he wants to get them together. They have a meal. And he, his goal is to get his friends to have food with him and Jesus. That's his strategy. To get his friends to have food with him and Jesus. When you're a follower of Jesus and you invite people into your flat, or when you invite people into your home for a meal, Jesus is with you, right? You are in Christ. Christ, Jesus, is with you. When you bring people in your home because you're a follower of Christ, then, then you're inviting someone to have, to have a meal with you and Jesus. In fact, I, I, I highly recommend praying over your flat before that person shows up. God, uh, Jesus, be here in a special way. Jesus, come meet with my friend today. Come meet with these people that I've invited over. That simple of, and just see what happens. Come over to my house for a meal and just see what happens when, when your friend has a meal with you when Jesus is there. Now, when it comes to this Levi story, this, this Matthew story, we don't see any fruit. It doesn't say, and, and people came to Christ or people came to believe. It doesn't say anything like that. As far as we know, zero people came to Christ. Matthew's plan was just, I'm going to get my friends who don't know Jesus to have a meal with me and Jesus. And see what happens. I think we're just kind of overthinking this sometimes. Even when you go out to eat with someone. Jesus, come with me. Come with me when I'm going out with my, with my friends this evening. Go, go, go out. Come out. Go, be, okay. this, this is off notes, but this is one of my favorite stories uh, of regarding hope history. History, history. So in, in, the, in the early days, in the early days, um, the church had a massive growth spurt in 2008. Okay. And this is this is what happened. There was there was this guy who who sat in the front row. Okay, uh, he came to church. He sat in the front row. Um, he kind of grew up with a Christian background, but but he wasn't very close to God at all. And so he, I mean, he was there. And and he and then he after church he went out to the pub with his friends with, with the OTC OTC right OTC ROTC OTC OTC right yeah went out with his friends and he talked about what I talked about. Okay, and they were all just like shocked and appalled at, at, at what had happened. And so then they all start coming to church to hear like what, what the crazy stuff was coming out of my mouth. And so they, they started filling up the first couple rows and then they would go to the pub and start talking about, can you believe what he said? And they would go off. Well, some of those people came to Christ and some of those people were able to, to, to officiate their weddings and, and to pray over them as, they, as God moved them throughout the world. But it just kind of starts with this guy showing up, going to the front. He doesn't even know Jesus is going with him, talking about how crazy this church is. And, 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 and his friends get intrigued and they want to be a part of this, this crazy chat. And so they, oh, I love it. It, 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 it can be really that simple. It can be really that simple when Jesus is active to, to seek and save the, the lost people. I can't make anybody a believer in Jesus. You can't make anybody a believer in Jesus. We're just looking to, to invite people or to look to see where God's at work. And then keep nudging people towards Jesus. If you ever need some encouragement in this area, start asking people, how did you become a follower of Jesus? Sometimes the stories are so simple and therefore so encouraging. Um, I, I love doing this. I, I was at this pastor's thing, like I said, a, a few days ago. I talked to this older pastor, and I was like, hey, not, not the one that's 39, but an older, older, an older, older pastor. And, and I asked him, you know, how, how did you come to know Jesus? And I was just going to listen to his story. And, and he said this. He said, well, I was 21 years old, 
And my Jewish girlfriend called me and said, I've given my life to Jesus. I've given my life to Jesus. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. So you, you, you didn't know God at all. You weren't even thinking about him. And your Jewish girlfriend became a Christian and said that she's given her life to Jesus. And, and that, that was it. And you started thinking about Jesus. And, and soon you, you gave your life to Jesus. And now you're a pastor. And you've been a pastor for all these decades. It, it just started like that. Yeah. This, this, my girlfriend said, I've given my life to Jesus. I just find that inspiring. When God's at work, how simple it, it can be. It can be. And some people are like, Brian, I can't talk to people about Jesus. I can't talk to people about Jesus because I don't know what to say. I don't even know enough. Well, remember the story of Matthew. Remember the story of that, 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 that guy's Jewish girlfriend or who, who, gave, who said those simple things. You didn't have to have all the answers. You just have to have an act of God. A God that's at work. A God that's at work. And, and if you don't know the answers, don't make them up. It's, it, it, that's, just, that's just mean. Just be like, I don't know. All I know is that I have given my life to Jesus. And just see what Jesus does with that. In their life. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I'm, I, I'm on a plane. I'm on two planes. Flying away. I'm going to go on a mission trip to Seattle. But don't tell people from Seattle that I'm going on a mission trip to Seattle. They, they, think that, they think I'm coming home for a visit. No. I'm here. I'm home. I'm going there on a mission trip. I'm speaking a bunch of times. I know that you guys prayed for me before that. But I really am thinking of this as a mission trip that I'm going to Seattle and speak in like 14 times. I'm, I'm going to be meeting with all these different people, encouraging different people about, about prayer, about what God's doing, encouraging them to, to be excited about, about Jesus and what God, Jesus is doing in the world. And in fact, I'm just going to be shameless. From the 5th to the 13th of July, I'm going to need lots of prayer. I'm speaking about twice a day, from the Sunday the 15th to Sunday the 13th, and, and just uh, cover me with prayer. If, if you want to know how it's going, I'm just going to be sending emails to the elders, kind of keeping them up to date. You can you can harass them. You can harass them. Hey, hey, how's it going? If if you want more updates, but man, it's going to be crazy. And not only am I teaching twice a day, my whole extended family is going to be there, and that's going to be really hard. It's going to be pretty awkward. It's not going to be smooth sailing. All right. So it's just one. Of, maybe you have an extended family like mine. Uh, but, but you can just pray for me during that time. But when I'm away, I'm going to be doing two things. I'm going to be preaching Jesus, and I'm going to be reevaluating what's, what's next for our church or where God is leading us. And, and we, He's got us on a great big path, and, and I like that, but well, maybe what are some of the small tweaks or adjustments that Jesus wants to make as we go into this next autumn? When, every, when I do this in the summers, um, I, Jesus usually gives me a guiding question to think about. And the guiding question that I'm taking with me as I go, at least one of them, is, Brian, if you wanted to see 50, 50, 50 people give their life to Jesus in the next 24 months, what tweaks would you have to make as a church? What, what little changes? How would you make more room for them? Like, what sort of things? And, and like, what, what adjustments would take place? So I find that a really interesting question. And, and I'm really, uh, really leaning into that. I, I have just become more and more motivated that God is active in wanting to see people come to faith. That He's at work drawing people in a, in a special way. We've seen different seasons of that over the years, over the last, I don't know, 11, 12 years that I've been in Scotland, just seasons where it's, it's not so much and then more. But, but God is currently at work doing that, and I want to be, I want our church to be on board with that, and so I'm going to be thinking about that. So anyways, if you'd pray for me this summer, as I preach, as I, as I plan for the autumn, as I seek Jesus' guidance on, 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 on our church for, for the autumn, I think, our, I think what's going on here is exciting. People are coming to Christ, people are getting baptized, and, 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 and that's fun and great. And I just want to make sure that we're joining Jesus in what He wants to be doing this year. And, and, and maybe that's uh, a special work of, of more salvations than we're used to seeing in, in a given year or a given season. I don't know, but that, that's what I'm praying for. And you can pray for me as, 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 do that as, I'm, as I seek. And you can, you can even be praying for God, how can I be a part of seeing more people come to Christ in the next year? Now, if you're here and you've not given your life to Jesus, uh, you're, you're here for a reason. 
Uh, God has been reaching out to you. He's been drawing you. It's amazing that you've walked in these doors. That doesn't just happen by chance. There is an active God at work uh, in you, calling you and inviting you to salvation. If you want to give your life to Jesus, if, uh, if you haven't done that, I just want to ask you, why wouldn't you give your life to this good God of ours? Why wouldn't you give your life to Jesus? Today, today is a, a great day to give your life to Jesus and be saved. And you can do that right after these challenges by going up and, and praying with someone. Uh, and they'll help you give your life to Jesus and be saved. I've got three challenges for tonight. Challenge number one is this, a seven-day willingness challenge. Hopefully this will become a 70-day and then a 700-day and then a 7,000-day willingness challenge. But we'll start small. Every morning, praying the simple words, Jesus, I am willing. Jesus, I am willing to talk about you today. Please give me the opportunity. Jesus, I am willing. And number two, uh, look for an opportunity to ask if you can pray for an unbeliever. You know, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? And uh, number three, have a meal with someone. Maybe with some unbelievers this week, praying that Jesus would join you. And just see what happens. Just, just see what happens. Hello, and thank you for watching our service here at ReHope. My name's Adam, and I'm on the pastoral care team. So, every Sunday, we invite people in the congregation to come up and receive some prayer ministry. And we want to actually extend that offer out to you guys who are watching. So, if you ever want to come and receive prayer ministry from us, just send us an email. If you get in touch with Hannah, who is our pastoral admin, her email address is hannah at rehope.co.uk. Okay, thank you very much, and God bless.